Before we, uh, before we begin our look at the final Beatitudes, we, we complete the series, uh, I would like to reflect a few moments on, on the words from um, one of my favorite uh, theologians and pastors, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he wrote a wonderful book called Studies in the Sermon on the Mount. And in, in speaking of the Beatitudes, he made three observations. And the first is this, read the Beatitudes and there you have a description of what every Christian is meant to be. It's not merely the description of some exceptional Christians. Our Lord does not say here that he's going to paint a picture of what certain outstanding characters are going to be and can be in this world. It's his description of every single Christian. And the second thing he said is all Christians are to manifest all of these characteristics. It's not that some are to manifest one characteristic and others to manifest another one. And then lastly, Dr. Jones said this, none of these descriptions refers to what we may call a natural tendency. Each of them is wholly a disposition which is produced by grace alone and the operation of the Holy Spirit upon us. And when you think about that, that all makes sense. It all makes sense. These are all traits that are found in those who know the Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts. Those who have given themselves and their lives and their wills completely over to him. And as we saw last week, they all stand as evidence of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. And they also stand as encouragement for the believer as they continue in their walk with the Lord. The first three Beatitudes, if you remember, were like like paradoxes. Blessed are those whose spirit is burdened, either poor in spirit or mourning, but also at the same, same time living in a gentle and humble way, all as a result of recognizing the seriousness of sin and how it has broken the relationship between mankind and God, and more importantly, how sin grieves God. And then the next few we looked at last week pointed more to the heart of the Christian. Those who yearn for the righteousness of God to rule the day. Those who show the mercy of God. Those whose hearts have been cleansed by God through Christ. And the peacemakers who reflect the nature of their Heavenly Father. And these all come about as, as an outward response to the new heart where forgiveness is given through the gospel. So we see the recognition of sinfulness, the cry to God for mercy, the reality of the gospel being poured into the heart of the believer, and the natural response to the gospel. And all of it, all of it brings glory to God. All of it is made possible through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So one would think, we read all that, that our lives would be smooth sailing through a bed of roses without a care in the world. I ran out of cliches. I couldn't come up with any more. We have Jesus. Our lives will be perfect. And the world will love us for it. (laughs) The fact is, when, when a Christian is living as a Christian in this world, while it's true that they'll be recognized as a true child of God, the response will not necessarily be positive, especially in our world today. And so this this next beatitude, as Jesus completes this part of his sermon, it serves to encourage the faithful, to remain faithful and persevere in the faith. So this morning we'll be again, once again, in Matthew chapter 5, and we'll be reading verses 10 through 12. Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Heavenly Father, again, we beseech you to bless the reading of your word into our hearts. We seek you for counsel. We seek you for encouragement. We seek you for guidance. And above all things, we seek you for your presence and your love within us. So, Lord, speak to us this morning. Let us hear from you. Let us be transformed. And let us leave this place knowing once again that we have heard from you. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You know, when a sermon preparation goes, this is one of, the, one of those passages where, where the main point is pretty easy to find. The word persecution appears in one form or another three times in these verses. And it's also helpful for us to note that, that Jesus, when he got to this part, breaks the pattern of all the other blessings. I mean, he starts the same way. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the same form as all the other ones. But then he expands on that. And he makes it personal and he makes it direct. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Because he recognizes the need for extra encouragement with this particular blessing, with this last beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted. And the key here is Jesus states why the persecution is happening. First of all, it's not because we did something that warranted or provoked that sort of treatment. There are times when people will say or do things that will bring upon them all sorts of bad behavior. We heard it in in the uh, first Peter's epistle that Robin read for us. They brought it on themselves. They brought the persecution on themselves, Christian or not. Jesus says here, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Now we take all these Beatitudes in context and we see that they, they sort of unfold before us, describing the Christian life. And so the righteousness spoken of here is a righteousness that is expressed in the life of a believer in Jesus. And that righteousness is the Lord's. It's his righteousness. It's not ours. It's not our self-righteousness. It's all his. So being persecuted or mistreated because of something you did wrong is not what Jesus is talking about here. As his children, we take on the attributes of our Heavenly Father. We exhibit fruit of the Holy Spirit. Our language changes, our desires change, our lives change, our behavior changes. We're constantly being transformed and molded into Christ-likeness. We long for his righteousness. We hunger and thirst for his righteousness, as the fourth beatitude told us. His righteousness begins to become evident in us. We exhibit his mercy. We exhibit his love. We're peacemakers because he's the ultimate peacemaker. We seek to honor God in all that we say and all that we do. And so his righteousness sort of radiates from us. It's evident in us. And the second thing is we're also not talking about people who try to imitate Christ because, you know, let's face it, those people are doing really good things and are acting in good ways. But this is not about doing the right thing. There are no laws against any of that, and most people would cheerfully welcome a person that lives that way. They certainly wouldn't insult them and they wouldn't ridicule them. How many times have we heard people speak of, they're a really great person. What a wonderful person. But that's not what we're talking about here. The Christian is different because the Christian is becoming more and more Christ-like, having the mind of Christ, living self-sacrificially, honoring God in all ways. And the Christian does all of that for the glory of God. The Christian does this all because the Holy Spirit directs them. The Christian does this all because we're children of the living God and therefore we resemble our Abba Father. The issue comes in with this. Righteous living, and that is living Christ-like, is offensive in this world. Seeking to live a life that honors God is in opposition to everything this world stands for. The world we find ourselves in now doesn't believe in God. The world doesn't acknowledge Jesus because they don't see their need for a Savior. And they certainly don't see the Scriptures as relevant. They say, God? Who believes in God anymore? It's foolish to believe in some invisible man upstairs. The Bible? That old book? It's ancient. Things have changed. We've come a long way since then. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Mankind has wandered away from God and become very self-righteous and self-centered to the point that they have replaced God with themselves. Now what's worse is that in other countries where the prevailing religion is anti-Christian, they interpret the righteousness of God and living as a Christian, they see that as blasphemy and they exact punishment accordingly. And so the righteousness of God, when it is evident in the life of a believer, 
is offensive to the unbeliever and to those who worship something else. And their response then comes in the form of persecution. And that is what Jesus is talking about. The word persecute means to harass or to trouble. But the Greek nuances that a bit. And it puts it in the sense of a hunter pursuing a prize. So the prize here for those who are persecuting Christians is to silent them, ridicule them, mock them, and in some extreme cases around the world, kill them. In our current times, we would say that it's to cancel them. And we wonder why. Why would godly living bring about this animosity? It doesn't make sense. It's all good to honor God, right? It's all good to want to live according to his will, right? God is righteous. He's holy. We want to live like him. We want to be like him. We're not doing anything wrong. The righteousness of God shines light on the unrighteousness of people. The holiness of God shows the unholiness of people. To the unbeliever, it shows their self-centered righteousness and their sinfulness. To the extremists in the world, it shows their misplaced faith. Because at the center of Christianity stands the cross. We trust in Jesus because of the cross. We trust in him because of what he did on that cross. He saved us from the wrath of God. His blood covers our sin. And he died, and he rose, and he ascended. And that message is offensive to those who don't believe in him. Before you were a believer, it was offensive to you. I don't need to be saved. I don't need forgiveness. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a good person. Or many might believe that, hey, we all end up in a wonderful place, thinking that we all rest in peace. Unless, of course, you're you're Hitler or some other horrific person. Or maybe you did something that's really repulsive, right? How many times we hear people read some story about something that happened and we'll say something like, there's a special place in hell for that person. It seems to be something has to be horrific before we say, oh, they're not going to heaven, but everyone else is. In reality, the gospel shows the absolute helplessness of people before God. It points out their desperate situation. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, right? It's able to separate bone from marrow. It's the power of salvation. It convicts the heart of sin. And those who are lost in darkness don't like it. They don't want to hear it. Jesus is saying here that those who are persecuted for living the righteousness of Christ are blessed. Blessed. Now, again, we we see how it works in the other Beatitudes, okay? You don't seek to be persecuted in order to receive this blessing. The believer whose heart is converted and mind is transformed will begin to take on traits of Christ, and the world will push against that. Those who suffer this kind of persecution are blessed because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we've heard this before, haven't we? We go right back to the blessing of the very first Beatitude. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It kind of forms that little set of parentheses around the whole thing. And the assurance is that if you're walking in the spirit, if you're walking in the light as he is in the light, your life will include persecution just as much as it includes a heartache over sin and unrighteousness. Now, nowhere in scripture does Jesus guarantee a trouble-free life. Instead, actually, in these verses, he pretty much guarantees a life of persecution. Now, this teaching from the Lord is hard. This is hard. I didn't sign up for this. Well, no, he signed you up for it. When we think of the other Beatitudes, they seem to be things that the world could accept. You know, you struggle over your separation from God. Everyone's like, okay, well, that's good for you. I understand. You mourn over sin and wrong in your life in the world. Well, most people would do that. And those blessings assure you of heaven. They assure you of comfort. And that brings about a heart that lives a gentle life, that reflects the gentleness of the good shepherd himself. So, yeah, he's a really nice guy. You long for his righteousness. You show mercy because you were shown mercy. And you're a peacemaker. Your hunger for righteousness is filled in him. You're a peacemaker with the message of the gospel, which 
makes peace between man and God. And it's all good. This is all good. But you'll also be persecuted. This message is tough because, quite honestly, no one, no one wants to be attacked. <laughs> you know, no one wants to be on the wrong end of this. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to be insulted today. But the Christian can expect it. This is probably why Jesus needed to turn this blessing into more of a personal blessing for each Christian. It's the only one he expanded on. Blessed are you. Blessed are you, dear Christian, when you're insulted or mocked or ridiculed. Blessed are you, dear Christian, when people say all sorts of wicked things about you in order to knock you down, in order to cancel you. And it's all because of Jesus. All because you are submitted to his lordship over you. Now, in other countries, we read about the incredible abuse that Christians suffer. Their families ex excommunicate them. Their houses are burned to the ground. They're put in prison. They're executed for their faith. But you know what? Since that happens on the other side of the world, we don't think much of it. We really don't. Maybe we donate to a missions organization, but we, we don't, it's not, it doesn't hit home for us. We're fortunate by God's gracious providence to live where we do, in a nation that doesn't abuse the church as much yet. There have been pastors who have been arrested, street preachers who have been locked up. A few years back, a mayor insisted a pastor of a large church submit his sermons for approval. Luckily, he didn't comply, and the problem sort of dissipated. But we do face persecution in this country today. Christians living the life of a Christian will face persecution. But it's more on a personal level. Now, the world loves it when the church does benevolent things. They love it. Look, the Halloween, they love giving away donuts and cider. That's great. What a wonderful church that is. They give. Oh, they give to the food bank. What a wonderful church. They love that stuff. They like it when we roll up our sleeves to try to help out around the community. Or we say some hopeful words. Or we show compassion. They love that. But try sharing the gospel with grace with those who affirm or defend the gay or the trans agenda today. Try graciously pointing out that their lifestyle is sinful and it's in rebellion with the word of God. You'll be falsely called a bigot and a homophobe. They'll say you're using hate speech. It's not hate speech. <laughs> if the church hates these poor lost souls, the church wouldn't plead with them to repent of their ways and turn to the living God. Instead, the church would just, you know what, let God's wrath take its course with them. It's not hate speech. It's love speech. It is love speech. But it's convicting. It's convicting. The word of God is indeed sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts right into the heart. Try sharing the gospel with someone who's an atheist. There's no God. So they'll tell you, there's no God. You're a fool for believing that. What's wrong with you? They'll compare your faith with believing in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. They'll mock you. They'll insult you. They'll ridicule you. Maybe they'll try and trip you up. Things like this. If there's a God, why does he allow bad things to happen? If there's a God, why do children die? Or they'll say, I can't believe in a God that sends people to hell. People are sending themselves to hell. God doesn't have to do that. And we're reminded that the psalmist says, only the fool says there is no God. Even the demons believe in God. So their self-righteous hearts have blinded them to see how they're separated from God by sin and they are desperately in need of a Savior. Try sharing the need for forgiveness. Try sharing how all have fallen short. And you might tell them that and they'll start to chuckle and they say, okay, well, I'll see you in hell then. But as, as you share more and more of this truth with them, you start showing them the need for forgiveness, the truth begins to convict them. And they don't like it. And then they look at you and they demand you stop judging them. Who are you to judge me? I'm not judging you. This is what God says. Try pointing out to someone that Jesus is the only way to God. And they'll argue that there are many ways to God. 
Every religion leads to God, and, and they'll say, you're claiming some sort of exclusivity. They'll say, not everyone believes that, so you shouldn't shove Jesus down their throat. The bumper sticker says, coexist. Well, the problem with that is it's logically impossible, since each religion claims that they're the one. So it's impossible. In reality, each religion tells you how, what you can do and what things you need to do to earn favor with God. But in only one, in only one, does God do what had to be done. In only one did God provide the necessary sacrifice. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now look, we have all experienced this in one form or another. And the fact that you have... The fact that you have experienced that kind of treatment is evidence that you are indeed a spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ. And but, but, the Lord continues, you, dear Christian, you can rejoice and you can be glad in all of that because great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. You are laying up treasures each time you take a barb or a sting or an insult from someone. You're laying up treasures each time you choose his will over the will of the world. You're laying up treasures each time you live the gospel in your life through word or deed. So you can rejoice and you can be glad because the prophets went through the same thing. You're in good company. You're in great company. Now why is that? The prophets carried a message of judgment. You read them. He carried a message of judgment. And look, they were not well received. Hey, let's invite Jeremiah over for dinner. Didn't happen. They carried a message of God's sovereignty. They carried a message of God's redemption for them. It was a call to repent. It was a message of conviction for sin. A casual read of the prophets will show you that they were not the most popular people in the world. They were mocked, insulted, ignored, imprisoned, beaten. And, and Scripture tells us, by the way, that there were many others. Let me just read something quick for you out of Hebrews 11. This is Hebrews 11. This is at the end of the, 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 uh, the hall of faith, we call it, right? The author says this, There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us, that only together with us would they be made perfect. There were others. There were many others in the Old Testament that we don't read about that were persecuted for righteousness sake. And after Jesus ascended, the persecution continued, right? In the fourth and fifth chapters of Acts, we read about Peter and other apostles who were dragged before the Sanhedrin, right? The temple leadership. And they were persecuted. They were beaten for declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. But on their release, they went on their way rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. How about that? The Apostle Paul was beaten and left for dead. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked. And he was eventually martyred, as were all the rest except for John. But he was sent off to a, a prison camp. Persecution for the righteousness of God. Persecution for the message of the gospel. Persecution for following the Lord Jesus is a part of the Christian life. You can be a good person and do the right thing, as we're all called to do. And people are going to love you for that. But once you bring the word of God into it, once you bring in the idea of sin and judgment, once you bring in the need for Jesus Christ, all bets are off. All bets are off. You have touched that wound, and you will suffer for it. Wow. <laughs> Maybe your pastor's getting arrested. <laughs> and so the question for us all... Just as we've been examining our hearts, as we've been going through all these Beatitudes, as we listen to all the other Beatitudes, the question is this. Do we see this trait of the Christian life in our own lives? Do you see it? Have you shared the gospel and been insulted for it? Have you sought to honor God and been ridiculed for it? 
Have people walked out of your life as a result of your faith in Jesus? Let me read another thing for you. This is from Matthew chapter 10. A couple of verses here from Matthew 10. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come, now listen, to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. It's inevitable that you're going to be insulted, you're going to be made fun of, you're going to be mocked, you're going to be said, don't talk about that here. How many, how many holiday dinners did you ruin? <laughs> it's inevitable that if you're a Christian, you're going to suffer in this way. One, one way or another, you will suffer for it. So what does it say then if we're not experiencing any of this? Have we become lukewarm and we're only trying to fit in, not make any waves? Are we afraid of people? Are we afraid of being canceled? I mean, what's more important to you? Obedience to the Lord or not looking like you don't belong? I think we need to hear the admonition from James. James wrote this. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? So therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, that's, those are strong words. Jesus himself, by the way, he did suffer quite a bit of persecution. <laughs> he knows exactly what it means, right? We see that website, Jesus gets it or he gets it or something, right? Well, he does get it. That's the truth. He does get it. He's been there. Anything we go through, he's already been through it. There's nothing that we can suffer that he hasn't been through. And he said to us, the world hates me. They'll hate you. We shouldn't be surprised. If we aren't living any of this, if this isn't a, a part of our experience in this, in this walk, then we really have to examine our hearts. And we have to see if we're bearing fruit of the Spirit. And have you suffered loss for Christ's sake? Have you been insulted for his name? Have you been made fun of for being a true follower of the Lord? Why do you go to church every Sunday? Just sleep in. You don't have to go. Why do you believe that stuff? Well, it's good for you. I'm going to read. We heard a little bit from 1 Peter this morning. I want to read a little more of that same, same section. This is uh, 1 Peter 3, 13 to 16. And this is what I think we have to keep in mind. Who is going to harm you even if, you're, even if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their hearts. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Live for Christ, he says. Live for Christ. You have nothing to fear. The threats and insults and persecution mean nothing. If anything, they validate what Jesus said would happen, and it affirms your faith in him. I mean, think of the words of Paul. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? So we really have no cause for fear. We're his children. We're his children. Will he not be with us as he promised? He's either sovereign, and he's sovereign over creation and over mankind, or he's not. What do you believe? Of course we believe that he's sovereign over everything. Then we have no reason to fear. And so we close our, our brief look at the Beatitudes. There are so, so many blessings for the Christian, so many wonderful things to look forward to. You know, the, the Christian, each one of us, we're, we're a sojourner, we're a pilgrim in this world. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And the way we live our lives as an ambassador for Christ is, as, as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, it, that's not our natural tendency. It's not who we are on our own. But as the Holy Spirit is molding us and he's transforming us and he's working in us, he's making us more Christ-like. And that is who we are becoming. And so, dear friends, let, let, let your hearts be filled 
with the compassion that Jesus has for you through all of these blessings. The contrite spirit and mourning over sin, that's evidence of the Holy Spirit indwelling your heart. And you're blessed with the comfort of knowing you are in the kingdom of heaven. Let his gentle nature just manifest itself in you and become a reflection of the gentle nature of your Savior, of the Good Shepherd. And that hunger and thirst you have for his righteousness in your life and in your heart and in the world, that will be satisfied, it will be filled with his righteousness. Be merciful, be merciful, as he was merciful toward you. He showed you great mercy. And when you do that, you declare the mercy of God toward men. You will be an instrument of peace, of his peace. And that will clearly identify you with your heavenly father and your savior, the prince of peace. And through it all, when the world pushes back on you because you're identified as a follower of Jesus, know that they are pushing against the conviction and power of the gospel that they see in you. Know that the prophets of old, the apostles, and the Lord himself were subjected to the same and oftentimes much worse treatment. So really we can be encouraged. We can be greatly encouraged because as I said, we're in really good company. When you get abused, you're in good company. All those prophets, they all had the same heart. Their heart's desire was to see God glorified and honored. And they were all treated the same way. The same way. So receive all of these blessings into your heart. Be comforted knowing that these were spoken by Jesus Christ himself. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. And he keeps every one of his assurances, every one of his promises. Live for him. Peter said, live for Christ, the one who purchased you with his blood. Keep your eyes fixed upon him, the one who called you into his kingdom. And know that, that by his grace, by his grace, you have faith in him. And all the blessings that Jesus preached in these Beatitudes, they've already been bestowed upon you. Amen? Yeah, Let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we... <laughs> We thank you for these blessings. We thank you for the assurances that we're in the kingdom of heaven. We're your children. That your righteousness will eventually rule the day. And that we're peacekeepers. We're, 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 we're peacemakers. We're instruments in your hands. And so, Lord, we, we, we leave here today convicted in our souls, praying that we would become more and more available to you that your spirit would speak through us into this sin-darkened world. And we pray, Lord, that as we are insulted and we're mocked and we're made fun of and whatever it might be, Lord, we pray that rather than getting defensive rather than, or rather than going home to hide, that we would rejoice. We would rejoice knowing that you too were mocked and insulted. The prophets were mocked and insulted. It just means we're sharing in your sufferings. And let us rejoice over that. So, Father, we pray that you continue to, to mold our hearts, change our hearts. Uh, let us be, again, just more available for you, that we would be servants, that we would be instruments, that we would be willing and able to give the reason for the hope that we have, the Lord Jesus, and all that he has done for us. So, again, Lord, we pray your blessings upon us. We thank you for the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We thank you for all that you have done in our hearts. And this we give to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.